everyone. Well, we are in Module 5, and in Module 5, I'd really like to start talking about how data can be misused. Um, in particular, we're going to look at an example in this module, and I'll go through it in quite a bit of detail and explain some of the background information to you. Um, but what I'd like to do is look at kind of, you know, how data can be misused so that we know how to flag it when somebody is trying to misuse it when we're looking at uh, research or whatever. So who misuses data? Um, well, lots of people misuse data. And to say that they misuse data, that's kind of a loose definition, and I'd like to keep it at that loose definition. Um, because I don't want to go out and out and say that somebody is just lying to you. Because um, oftentimes there's quite a bit of truth in what they're telling you. They just haven't told you all of the truth. So quite often, as, we, as we've seen, marketers or advertisers, um, they'll bend the truth or misuse data, or they'll take a claim and try to make it mean more than it really means. Um, certainly, I'm sure we can see that politicians do this. Um, social media, a lot of the stuff we see on social media is just, whether it's marketing information or information intended to sway an audience, um, it doesn't always use the best sort of presentation of data or research. And then there's those with important political causes um, and economic causes as well, those that are really driven by something that is very important to them. Um, they will present data that is not always meant to sort of represent what it's representing, what they think it's representing. So essentially those who have something to gain by convincing people of something. So are they out and out lying? Well, sometimes they are. You know, sometimes the rules of truth are broken. And, and that happens often when there's less of an downside. You know, there's not really going to be much that happens to them for lying. Um, sometimes there's a great deal that happens to them for lying. They can be brought up on charges. They can be brought up on, they can be sued. Um, but when those things aren't, or, you know, an issue, those aren't a factor, um, then there's really less of a downside. Sometimes um, uh, agencies or organizations will lie when there's basically no chance of attribution. That's basically what that means is that we're not going to we're not going to be able to trace it back to them. Um, we're not going to be able to find out who did it. Um, and then sometimes, even if there's kind of a downside, if there's a reputational downside, or even if there's a financial or even a legal downside, sometimes the benefit of what they may get from bending the truth is greater than the risk of those downsides. But most time when we have somebody who's misusing data, they're really stretching the truth or bending the truth. So they're not necessarily lying, but they're trying to maybe potentially, like for example, exaggerate. And they're trying to say that the data means something more than they mean. Um, or they mean something that they really don't. Um, where, but, but in both of those cases, there's a kernel of truth in what they're saying. Is that, yeah, the data mean A, um, but what they're also saying is the data mean A, B, and C. And well, the data may mean A, it's shaky whether or not it means B, and it flat out does not mean C. So, um, but they can mount convincing arguments that convince people that the data actually do mean A, B, and C. And, you know, their arguments are very convincing, so people believe them. Um, Sometimes they're not disclosing the full story. So it could be data means A, it means B and C under certain conditions. And they fail to tell you that it's under certain conditions that the data mean B and C. Or they take a story completely out of context. You know, something, you know, some minister somewhere said, you know, or some government official somewhere said this, um, but instead of actually putting it in the context, which may refute some of what they're reporting, they just take it out of context. So, again, it's about turning public opinion into their favor. Um, and that's why it's so important for us to develop a critical eye so we can see when somebody's trying to do this to us and we can really question what they're saying and, you know, sort of demand from them that they, they back up their arguments and defend their positions. We're going to talk about global climate change. And global climate change is perhaps still today one of the biggest issues um, that is hotly debated in politics. Um, and it's, very, it's a very important issue. Um, and because it's such an important issue and it's such a hotly debated uh, political issue, there are those on the side that say that there's no such thing as climate change or that climate change, while it may exist, really isn't that important, doesn't really impact us that much, um, who have constructed very well-funded, very complex, and very convincing arguments that there, in fact, is no such thing as climate change. And the reason why they've done that, the reason why they've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort on this is because there's a great deal of money to be made or lost. Climate change is really a result of the, of the fossil fuel industry. And the fossil fuel industry in the world, not just this country, but in the world, is incredibly powerful. And it, has, it exhibits a great deal of, of control politically, economically, and a whole different uh, sphere of, um, 
you know, politics and government and markets that is probably unequaled. Um, and there's a great, amount of, a great amount of infrastructure that has been put in place in order to support kind of the climate change or the current, I'm sorry, the current system. Um, it's not just the processing of fossil fuels and the like, but it's all of the infrastructure that extracts the, the material out of the ground and gets it to the place where it needs to go and refines it and, you know, down to the usage of it. All that is very, very important and a great deal of money has been put into it. So because of its economic impact, the question of climate change has become very politicized, now, which is unfortunate because it's really not a political issue. It's an environmental issue. Um, but the battle lines have been drawn, and that's, I like to say, that's, in, that's an unfortunate. And, and both sides are using data. Um, sometimes they're using data well, and sometimes they're using data poorly. Um, but that's really to influence the general population, to try to convince the people that their position is correct. So before we really go into kind of the arguments and how people are using data for climate change, I think it's important for us to go through kind of a primer. And this is going to be a primer of basically the factors that are important to climate change. Um, and so we'll go through that real quick. It's a few slides, and it will give you some background on kind of those things that really impact or are impacted by climate change or are tied to climate change and why this argument is so complex. So first things first, most living things are made up of carbon. So most dry mass, um, which makes up, you know, plants and animals and us and stuff like that, is almost a huge percentage of carbon, okay? And, and that's mixed with other things to actually make, uh, you know, living life. So that also applied to the biomass from millions of years ago, the plants and the dinosaurs and the animals and all those things that eventually, through various plate tectonics and the like and over the years, became uh, coal, oil, gas, etc., that carbon that was originally part of the living biomass is still trapped in the coal and oil and gas where it, it sits. And it stays there until we burn it. So when we burn it in our cars, we release that carbon. And when we burn it as coal to power power plants, electric power plants, it, we, we, we release our carbon. Even when we burn wood, we release carbon atoms. So when they're released into the air, they sort of free flow and kind of hang out until they run into an oxygen a molecule. An oxygen molecule is the O2 part. So there's a natural chemical process that causes carbon and or oxygen molecules to bind together. And when they do that, when we release native carbon into the air and it binds with oxygen, it creates carbon dioxide. So the C plus the O2 is the carbon dioxide atom. And that then gets released to the atmosphere, right? So we contribute each time a carbon atom and an oxygen atom, uh, a pair of oxygen atoms combined, they get released into the atmosphere and just contributes to the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So why is that a problem? Well, it is it is and isn't really a problem. In fact, without carbon dioxide, we would be in big trouble. So for millions of years, carbon dioxide has been a temperature controller for the Earth. It's like the Earth's thermostat. Okay? When we have too much carbon dioxide, the Earth gets too hot, so we've turned the heat up too much, right? And there's been evidence that we've done that in the past, mostly long before humans were here. We did It was done through volcanic activity. So volcanic activity dumped a ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and the Earth got really hot. And there have also been times when, you know, natural processes take carbon dioxide out. That could be forests. You know, when a forest grows, it sequesters or holds carbon dioxide in the wood and pulls it out of the atmosphere. Um, plants do the same thing. But for whatever reason, we pull way too much carbon dioxide out of the air and the Earth gets too cold. So, And the reality is, is that we couldn't really survive without carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Um, the Earth would be inhospitable without it. So there's even scientific evidence that suggests that there have been extremes. Um, there have been some scientific evidence that points to the fact that in its 4.5 billion year history, at one point in time, the Earth was a snowball for 500 million years because the carbon dioxide levels were so, so low. And, um, and we couldn't trap enough heat in the atmosphere to warm it up. And they said that that was offset by a sudden increase over many thousands of years of um, volcanic activity, which then put carbon dioxide back into the air and make, made the Earth hospitable again. And just kind of a side note, the way we measure carbon dioxide is parts per million. So if you take a million parts of the atmosphere, how many of those parts are actually carbon dioxide? And that level was about 280 parts per million. And we can go back as far as 800,000 years. If we trap you know, air bubbles in ice that's been around for a very, very long time, 
we can measure the level of carbon dioxide in that, and it will tell us that, in fact, carbon dioxide levels were about 280 parts per million for about the last 800,000 years. That was good until the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution started releasing a whole lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And carbon dioxide sort of acts like the windshield in your car. What it does is it lets the heat in and holds some of it in. And that's good. Again, that makes the Earth hospitable. The more we put into the atmosphere, though, the more heat it traps and the more less heat it lets out of the atmosphere. So, And that's the way it's similar to your, uh, your car's windshield. Your car's windshield will let heat in, but it won't let it out. Um, and that's how things start to heat up. So as I indicated, burning coal, oil, and gas releases carbon into the air. And that increases the heat. Um, when it becomes massive on a global scale, it can begin to have an impact. And so if you travel anywhere in the world, you'll see cars are everywhere. And what you don't see is you don't see power generation. And power generation in many places, especially in Asia and especially in China, is done by burning coal or burning massive amounts of coal. And that's how we actually generate electricity. So that's also having an impact. And so that's kind of what's happening right now is that we are, we're dumping all this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and that is causing uh, global warming, so say the scientists. So here's kind of a graphic that shows you kind of what happens. Um, the sun hits the earth. The Most of the sunlight that hits the earth bounces right back off of it, otherwise it would be too hot here. And But the carbon dioxide actually catches some of it on its way out and keeps it, traps it, keeps it into our atmosphere, which is what makes the planet hospitable. When we increase the amount of carbon dioxide that is actually in the atmosphere, we increase the amount of sunlight that we do not let back out, and that's what uh, makes the climate a little warmer. Now, here's a graphic that shows how much carbon dioxide we actually have in the atmosphere. And as I indicated earlier, up until the Industrial Revolution, we were at about 280 parts per million, and that held pretty close to that level until about the turn of the, the 20th century. When things really started taking off, when industrialization really started spreading around the planet, and we really started burning fossil fuels, then we saw the level of carbon dioxide kind of hockey stick there. And the current level of carbon dioxide at the point that this video is being made is 410 parts per million. And that was recorded at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. They actually record the carbon dioxide levels there simply because it's not influenced by anything close to it. Hawaii's kind of isolated, and there's not enough industry there to sort of influence the carbon dioxide levels. So they measure it in a place that's fairly isolated, and they can get a fairly accurate reading. But you can see that it's gone up to 410 parts per million. Many scientists believe that we need to stay under 350, which we passed up quite some time ago. So there's a big effort to try to get us back down to 350. So one of the ways that we could get back down to 350 is forests. Plants and trees are a great part of carbon control, because what they do is, if through photosynthesis, they gather the sunlight and they convert the uh, carbon into something that the plants and trees can actually use. But they hold it. Um, and a tree lasts many, many years. You know, you grow a tree, it lasts, you know, 50 to 100 years, even longer. So while it's growing, as it's gathering uh, carbon, it's holding that carbon in the wood, in the tree. So on a massive scale, if the planet were to restore a lot of the forests that have been cut down, that could have a substantial impact on the level of carbon dioxide that's currently in the atmosphere. But the impacts are being felt now, and we can see that by comparing a picture from 1941 of the Muir Glacier in Alaska. Um, that's where the ice was in 1941, over there on the left, and then over there on the right, there's no more ice. Um, it has melted off already, and there is a, <clears throat> a lot of evidence that shows that the further north you go, the more the climate change impact is going to be seen. We'll also see a lot of more, or we're also going to likely to see a lot more storms, a lot more severe storms, and see storms in places where we've not seen storms before. So the average global temperature has already risen almost a full degree, um, probably a full degree by now. And that's just up about 0.2 degrees in just five years. And that doesn't seem like very much. But when you think about it, the atmosphere in the, on the planet, the atmosphere that it controls the temperature, has remained fairly constant for a long time. And the adjustments are tiny. Even though there have been ice ages and there have been times when it's been warm, those adjustments have come over thousands of years, and they've taken a long time to actually get into place, and, and they're controlled by very small changes in temperature. So when we increase the greenhouse gases, it's going to cause you know a whole lot of impact, including loss of land due to rising seas, loss of farmland where it's just too hot to grow crops, loss of water sources that have typically come from winter snows. When it's warmer, the winter snows will melt faster, 
and that means that we won't get running water as much into the summer season. And then loss of many species that depend on the world's current climate, um, and that's actually happening right now. Okay, so why don't we fix this? Um, and this is going to lead to why is the argument about climate change such a complex one? Well, according to Bill McKibben, um, as many scientists have agreed, we need to stay under a 2 degree Celsius increase in average global temperature in order to avoid most of the worst impacts of climate change. Okay. Well, that two degrees is currently now, we've, we've increased one degree already, so we're, we've got one degree left to go. Okay. The 555 gigatons is the amount, the estimated amount of carbon we can contribute, continue to contribute into the atmosphere and still remain under two degrees Celsius in our, our, our global climate change increase, our global temperature increase. The problem is, is that current oil companies and, and energy companies coal companies and companies like that have already got in their possession, um, in their plans, in fact, uh, far more than that, almost five times that, uh, 2,795 uh, 2, gigatons of uh, fossil fuels that they're intending to burn, or intending to dig up and burn, whether it be oil or whether it be coal or whatever it is, they're intending to actually use that to drive economic, uh, economic growth and benefit. And the problem with that is we can't just shut down the oil companies and say, no, you can't do that, or the coal companies and say, no, you can't do that, because our global economy is so interconnected that if we were to shut down the oil companies that are a tremendously powerful part of the global economy, we would crash the global economy. So we have to make massive changes in how our economic structure is set up. We can't just allow the oil companies to continue the way they're connected, they're continuing because they're likely to have an impact on the climate that is not what we want. But we can't just shut them down because we'll shut everything else down economically as well. So there's a great deal of money and a great deal of profits that are at risk. And it's again, it's not just the oil companies, but it's the overall global economy that stands to really take a hit if we don't come up with a way to be able to sort of replace the economic gains and benefits currently offered by the fossil fuel industry with something that is sustainable and renewable and will support the economy in the same way. So that's where the, the argument comes in. That's, where, that's, where, that's why it's so passionate on both sides. Because we're really talking about the world economy here. And, but we're also talking about the world's environment here. So these are big issues. And they're big arguments on both sides. And so a lot of data has been gathered and used in order to sort of say, Yes, climate change is real, or no, climate change is not real. And it's not necessarily whether or not it really is or isn't real. It's what are the motivations behind the use of the data and the use of the research to try to prove the points that the arguers are trying to make. But science says it's real. Okay, So 97% of scientists in the world say that humans are causing climate change. Okay, And that's a pretty overwhelming majority. And what's more important about that is that of those 97%, they're they're scientists who are conducting independent studies, independent of each other. There are government agencies and ministries that have said that, yes, we believe, based on the scientists, that there is a problem here. There's the uh, United Nations uh, Panel on Climate Change, Intergovernment Panel on climate, climate Change, that has done a tremendous amount of work in this field. And they say that this is a problem. Okay. But who says it isn't real? Well, as I indicated, it's going to be those who have substantial financial benefits to lose, right? And it's going to also be those who support them. So in our particular case, we're looking at oil companies, we're looking at coal companies. We might also be looking at other financial companies that are tied to the oil industry. That would be banks and other finance companies. And it would be those either who work for those companies, those who are supported by those companies, or the politicians that are supported by those companies. Okay. So how do they spread their message? Well, there are five methods that are commonly used to deny climate change. And these are things that we, as critical thinkers with a critical eye, can look out for when we're starting to see arguments that are against climate change. There are things like you, the use of fake experts, the use of logical fallacies, something called impossible expectations, which I'll explain later, cherry picking, and conspiracy theories. Let's take a look at fake experts. So with fake experts, what's often done is not just climate change that we do this, and we do it in medical research and other research, and it's where we find experts and scientists who say, in this particular case, in this particular case, climate change is a hoax, right? 
And there's, there's a number of them that are out there. And there's a number of studies that have been funded by oil companies, just like there were studies that were funded by cigarette companies in the past to say that, you know, cigarettes do not cause lung cancer. So in this particular case, one of the ones that is cited the most is something called the Global Warming Petition Project. And what it's asking is it's asking scientists that if you don't believe in global warming, you don't believe that humans are the cause of climate change, then we want you to sign on to this petition. So 31,000 uh, scientists have signed on to that petition. And that's pretty overwhelming. 31,000 scientists seems like a large number. But that's where we got to get the whole story. Okay? They say that 31 scientists don't believe in climate change, but those scientists can be a scientist in any field. They could be a geologist. They could be a mathematician. They could be a computer scientist. And what we're really looking at is we're really looking at the opinions of people who don't have a whole lot of expertise in the climate uh, research field. And in fact, the percentage of people who are actually climate scientists that have signed on to the Global Warming Petition Project is less than 1%. It's in fact one-tenth of 1%. And it only requires a bachelor's degree in some kind of science to actually be a member of the Global Warming Petition Project. So the public hears scientists, it assumes that there's credibility there. But the problem is, is the scientists are, for whatever reason, signing on to this petition, even though they don't really have any expertise in the field. That's where we, and in a situation like this is where we really need to apply a critical eye um, and say, okay, what are these people really doing? Because it doesn't take much to apply a critical eye to find out who more about the 31,000 scientists that have signed on to this project. So that's how fake experts can be. Is this just one example of how fake experts are used? Logical fallacies. Um, something we haven't talked about too much is uh, fallacies. And it's something that's quite often talked about in critical analysis. Because fallacies are the ways that really good arguers, those who want to put forward a really good argument, can set you up in order to believe something that really just doesn't follow. So it's a way to draw a conclusion. Um, and when we draw a conclusion, we want to draw a conclusion based on information that we've received, information we've looked at. Um, ideally, there's we're left in a situation when we draw a conclusion that there's no other possible uh, course of action, that the, that the conclusion follows on from the argument that has been made. But with a fallacy, a fallacy allows the arguer to sort of kind of misdirect your attention and sort of misguide you and draw you to a conclusion that wasn't really supported by the facts. And the arguments against climate change often use logical fallacies. Okay, So here's one that they use. They say that climate change must be a natural process because the climate has always changed naturally in the past. And as I indicated in earlier slides, it has. It, we've seen you know very big fluctuations in the climate. Um, and we've got evidence, scientific evidence, to show that it's, you know, times have been very cold and times have been very warm. And it's the, it's the data from the scientists themselves that show this. You know, it kind of supports this uh, fallacy that climate change must be a natural process. So the deniers point to that and claim that the precedent shows that climate changes are natural. And they are. In fact, they are natural. But what they leave out is they leave out the fact that climate change typically doesn't happen over the course of 200 years or 250 years, as has been the case in this example. And it also doesn't change this drastically in that short amount of time. Climate change in the past has typically taken hundreds, if not thousands, uh, even longer years for these, these giant changes, these giant swings in climate. Um, and what we're doing is basically in the blink of an eye. So they fail to include that piece of information in their argument intentionally fail to include that piece of information in their argument and try to draw the conclusion that climate change is a natural process. Well, it is a natural process. However, it's not in this case. Okay. So we cannot deduce that climate change is, the climate changes we are seeing is uh, now is natural from this line of argument right? because we've left out key pieces of information. The third one is impossible expectations, and that is, uh, deserves some explanation. So the tools to use, um, the tools that we use to predict weather and the impact of climate change are climate models. And a model is something that is oftentimes used to predict likely outcomes. So we will take past data and we will build a model and that model will take past data and present data and it will predict a likely outcome based on what we know. And so these are fairly complex and they're fairly refined, but they're also prone to error. Right? A model that makes a prediction is prone to error. They don't do so good in the short term. 
they do much better in the long term. So when we factor in all of the factors that can impact our projected or predicted output, um, over a long term, we have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen, especially in a climate change model. The problem is, is that there will be those who look at the predictions that have come out of climate change models, and they'll see where there's a short-term fluctuation, right? In the short term, we got it wrong, maybe because in the long term, it'll take just a little longer to get to where we thought we were going to get to. But in the short term, it looks like we got the model wrong. So they point to that and they say, oh, no, that, that model's no good. Um, that particular, you know, you, you said next year it would be X degrees, and it's not, it's Y degrees. And so your model's no good. And they throw out the baby with the bathwater and say that the whole thing is flawed. Well, what they're having is impossible expectations because a model is always going to be prone to error. Um, it'll be prone to error in the short term. It'll be prone to error in the long term. <clears throat> it's just over the long term, the model and the slight errors that you see in the short term don't matter because the model actually predicts a general trend that isn't changing. It's not going away. We're still getting warmer. There's still problems with climate change. It just may not be happening in exactly the way we thought it was going to happen in the short term. So the climate change deniers are placing impossible expectations on models and then cite those uh, uh, you know, differences. Um, they cite them as inaccurate and when the, uh, those expectations are not met. So that is <coughs> something that's happening quite a bit. Um, it's kind of a short-term versus long-term uh, view of how climate change is working. Cherry picking is pointing to short-term localized data that kind of flies in the face of climate change. And so a good example would be, you know, if you go outside in February and it's snowing, well, then you say, well, I guess there's, there's, no, there's no such thing as climate change. Or if you have a senator, um, a U.S. senator that throws a snowball on the Senate floor, um, he's you know doing it to prove that there's no such thing as climate change, right? We still have snow. Um, these are ridiculous arguments, and they're very localized, and they're very short-term. If you look at the stock market as an example, you can see that the stock market fluctuates up and down, up and down, up and down. And we hear all the time about the stock market fluctuations. But the general trend over the last five years, ten years, has been that the stock market has really taken off since the depression or since the recession. Since the Great Recession, we've really regained a whole lot of value in the stock market and then exceeded where we were. So the general trend is up. And that's the same thing with the the amount of carbon dioxide and also a global temperature. The general trend is up. And it's also a global trend. It's not something that's happening in your own backyard, and it's not something that's happening on the U.S. Senate floor. It is something that's happening around the world. So <clears throat> this cherry-picking is identifying very specific bits of information that you can say are contrary to the argument, so you throw the entire argument out when it's a complete fallacy and doesn't even wash at all. There's also something called the climate change hiatus, and currently what we're seeing is we're seeing a slowing in the amount of warming that the planet is experiencing. But that, and that's being used to say, well, see, we're solving this problem. Um, the climate change problem is not as bad as we thought it was. Um, that's also a cherry picking in the sense that there are reasons, explain, or explained reasons why we're seeing this hiatus. And it's not uh, indicative of the fact that we're not dumping carbon into the atmosphere. That's continuing. And also, it's not uh, an indicator of the fact that the temperature and the amount of heat and the amount of acid in the oceans is also increasing, all, all factor of climate change. Those are all increasing. They're just increasing at a lower rate. And just because they're increasing at a lower rate, the speed of which can be explained by other factors, doesn't mean that we've actually solved this problem. So cherry picking <clears throat> is a, just another method that's used, but it's no more valid than the others. Lastly, and these are some of the, uh, unfortunately, they're some of the most easily defeated arguments, but unfortunately they're very powerful. They're very powerful because you get people worked up. Um, and these are conspiracy theories. And they're things like, you know, uh, climate change is a myth that is brought on by scientists to further their own agendas. So there's people who believe that, you know, and they typically believe it without any sort of evidence being shown to them. Another one that I've recently heard was climate change is a myth used to get more funding for scientists. Um, again, how do you argue against stuff like that? I mean, you probably look at somebody and think, where did you even hear that? So conspiracy theories often, you know, sort of rally people and get people kind of worked up. And if they're already prone to believe a particular uh outcome anyway, whether it be fallacious or something that is supportable, um, you're not likely to change a conspiracy theorist's mind. Um, they'll look at any evidence that goes against this, uh, the conspiracy as just another part of the conspiracy. 
So <clears throat> that's why it's important to apply a critical eye, especially to an issue as complex as climate change denial. And we have to look at, you know, okay, what is this person telling us? This person is presenting an argument to me, and what is, what is he or she telling me? And, but, but it's more than that. It's what does the data tell us? And what does the research support? If they, have they done good research? Have they actually done any research? In the case of conspiracy theory, quite often they've done no research. So, but if they have done research, what has it told us? And what does it support? We also might need to think about what is the motivation of those that either oppose or support the, um, the data or the research? Why, why are they so passionate about it? And can we find any bias in their work? Or is you know the agenda of the denial researchers or those who fund them, what is their agenda? Why are they doing it? Um, there have been a number of papers that have been written that deny climate change. 90% of those are funded by those who are aligned with the fossil fuel industry. So you, you hear these numbers and you see that you know, 31,000 scientists that say that climate change is no good, that there's no, is nothing to be worried about. Um, and they've published papers that say that climate change is nothing to be worried about. Uh, but then you have to go back and look at the agenda, right? What is the agenda of these people, and what are they trying to, what are they trying to put forward, and, and why are they doing it, and how are they, uh, what is the benefit to them? So <clears throat> this is really an effort to concentrate efforts to undermine the public's perception of climate change, um, and it's fairly concentrated and it's fairly organized. You know, it's within the fossil fuel industry, it's within certain other sectors. Um, but there's no such concentrated effort on the other side. And in fact, much of the research that's been done over the last 30 or 40 years on climate change has been very diffuse. Um, it's done independently by a number of other, uh, of different or other researchers around the world or government agencies around the world. Yet, despite their, their separate uh, efforts, they're all coming to common conclusions. So it's, it's funny that the one side is concentrated on putting out one message, the other side is not concentrated, but yet is still coming to a similar message, a similar message together on the, on the other side of the issue. So think tanks, um, in this particular issue, think tanks spend a lot of money to produce flawed research and information campaigns. So here's an argument, sort of a line of, of thinking, a line of, uh, a, a line of argument, I guess, um, that <clears throat> a lot of think tanks have been putting out, and this is sort of a, each one of these is linked together. So the first statement is, you know, well, carbon dioxide is not actually increasing. Well, but, but it is. And I can show you the data that shows you that it is. Okay. And there's lots of independent measures that show you that carbon dioxide is actually increasing. Okay. Well, so that even if it is, the increase has no real impact on the climate since there's no convincing evidence of warming. Okay. Well, but there is convincing evidence of warming. Um, and we can show you evidence of that as well. And in one of the complementary or supplementary videos that I posted, there's a very good indication of how that's measured around the planet. So then the argument could be, okay, well, then if there is warming, it's due to natural causes, right? Just that's kind of one of the fallacies that we've talked about. Well, it's not really because you're not looking at the time frame over which this is happening, and you're not looking at other factors that indicate that, in fact, the planet is warming at a much rapid, much more rapid rate than we had expected. So then the argument could be, if, even if the warming cannot be explained by natural causes, the human impact is small, and the impact of continued greenhouse gas emissions will be minor. Well, that's an argument that says, you know, the humans can't possibly impact the atmosphere of the entire planet. But in fact, we are. So even if the current and future projected human effects on Earth's climate are not negligible, even if they're kind of significant, the changes are generally going to be good for us. Well, there actually is an argument out there that, well, won't it be better if, if certain areas are warmer? Won't they have longer periods where we could grow crops? Um, would there be more areas where people can live? <clears throat> um, well, but there's a lot of people who live in places now that are going to be inhospitable. And there's a lot of people who won't be able to grow crops because they won't have the water or they won't have the, the climate that they need to be able to do that. And that's also very human-centric in the sense that um, as we change the climate, we're not the only beings on this planet, and we're taking out a good number of them with us as we change the climate. All right, <clears throat> the last part of the argument is, okay, whether or not climate uh, the changes are going to be bad or good for us, Humans are very adept at adapting to changes. Besides, it's too late to do anything about it, and or technology's fix is a technological fix is bound to come along when we really need it. And that's one of the last arguments that really has no basis in fact. Is that technology will will sell, will save us? Um, has it saved us yet? Um, it's probably going to come along too late, um, but it's but it's an argument that's often put out.
All right, and I indicated already, why do they do it? Why do they argue so fervently that there is no such thing as climate change? And as I indicated, there's a lot of money at stake. You know, it's not just for the fossil fuel companies, but investors, banks, and the whole economy is dependent on being sort of interconnected with many companies, many industries, not the least of which is the fossil fuel industry. So we've based our economic future on, you know, a connection to the fossil fuel economy, and we have to change that, right? So there's a lot of people who want to protect that investment, um, and protecting that investment, the easiest way to do that is just to leave it alone, keep it where it is. Um, but that, of course, is going to bring catastrophic climate change issues. Um, so we put forward alternatives, and some of the alternatives are to use, you know, renewables, uh, whether it be solar or wind, and there's just not a lot of confidence that these folks have. Well, there's not a lot of financial incentive in many cases for them to change, and there's not a lot of confidence that they have that these, on a wide scale, can actually have the impact that um, we want them to have in order to be able to replace the fossil fuel industry. So from a data perspective, this shows how data can be used or even manufactured. The arguments against climate change, even though there's 90%, 97% of scientists that have studied the issue, of climate scientists that have studied the issue, say there is a problem here and we do need to deal with it, um, the other side manufactures data or arguments just to try to put forward their perspective. So how it can be transformed into biased information, leading to biased knowledge, is really a, an important thought, right? We're pull, pulling out the data from the studies, and then that data, whether it's you know pro-climate change or anti-climate change, eventually becomes knowledge. Um, you know, it becomes information, then becomes knowledge. So that's kind of that whole process. And how do we um, how do we ensure that what's coming out from the data um, turns out to be something that is actually supportable? by the data and the research, okay? Climate change is a highly complex issue. And as I indicated, you know, a lot of time, a lot of money has gone into both sides to try to make sure that um, we are able to influence public opinion the way that we want to. So this, this really underscores our need to develop our skills to critically analyze data and hear about the, what the, hear, that we hear about in the media and on social media. And uh, <clears throat> that's because the arguments are so complex and have been so um, very sort of tightly wound. So it's really up to you to figure out what you're willing to believe and why and you know to ask the questions about what is what is it about this issue that I'm willing to accept and what do I know and what do the data tell me. I have posted also uh, companion videos that I think go along with uh, five different reasons why people deny climate change. Uh, I think you'll find them very interesting so I hope that you'll watch them. Um, they do a really good job of kind of dissecting the arguments against climate change. Um, and that's, I think, given to give you a good perspective of how arguments in general can be constructed uh, and how they can take in information that is either not valid or take in information that is not useful and put it to good use. So it'll help you uh, understand how people are getting the information that they can use to develop our critical analysis skills. And it can also help us develop a better understanding of the truth. Okay, so watch, you've watched this video, now go ahead and watch those five other videos, and that should prepare you for your response to this week's discussion post.